Um, he eats up script kiddies for breakfast, I heard. Uh, he drives the open source train, and his currency is uptime. Uh, please welcome, with a very warm applause, Julian Oliver and his server infrastructure for Global Rebellion Talk. Thanks. <clears throat> So, um, yep, great, very pleased to be here, amazing uh, environment indeed, as usual with the CCC. Um, yeah, first of all, um, I'm not uh, at all a spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion, I do not speak for this movement called um, Extinction Rebellion. Uh, whatever I say here tonight is entirely um, my own opinion, and uh, so not to be taken as any um, um, you know, overarching description of the movement um, uh, more generally. Um, what you're looking at here, of course, um, might be might seemingly be associated with this thing called Extinction Rebellion, but it is not. Um, it is, um, in fact, the um, extinction symbol. And this is the part where in the first half of my talk I depress you, but then we'll go for a nice big sort of warm finish. Um, the extinction symbol um, was, in fact, created um, in 2011 by a UK artist um, uh, called ESP. And this um, entirely uh, relates to a not Extinction Rebellion, being long before Extinction Rebellion, but um, the fact that we have entered the sixth mass extinction on this planet that we are on. And um, this is, uh, became practically scientific consensus in uh, 2015, uh, where it has been fairly surely um, asserted and since reasserted that we have in fact entered the, the largest um, um, extinction event on this planet in 65 uh, million years. Um, global populations of fish, birds, mammals, down by about 60% uh, in uh, 42 years according to the WWF um, a few years ago. Um, the UN um, puts it at about 150 species lost per day. Now, that's a little bit more than the, the father of biodiversity, E.O. Wilson, that says it's around about 27,000 a year. In other words, one species lost every 19 minutes. But what does that really mean? Well, when we're talking about background extinction rates, we're looking at, um, at, the, at the background extinction rate for the last 65 million years has been about one to five species a year. So not... 150 a day, but one to five a year. This is fairly conclusive um, of, uh, of, of the fact that we have entered the, the sixth extinction on this planet. Um, here in Germany, for instance, um, just a couple of years ago, uh, there was this uh, Dutch-German study done um, that now reflects pretty much the state of the entire European continent um, of a, of a, of a three, three quarters of all flying insect um, biomass uh, dropping in about 25 years. So three quarters less flying insects in 25 years. It's supposedly dropping at around about 2.5 a year. Now, we need insects um, much more than they need us. Uh, they are the glue layer of our, of our food system, but within the planetary boundary and biological sense, they are absolutely intrinsic. Um, they also keep much of our water very fresh. As one biologist put it, um, we humans will never see the, the end of the insects. Uh, we need them that much. Now, climate change has become um, uh, very much the, the, uh, the ascribed to this, um, this, this loss of, 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 uh, of species, but in fact, it's not climate change that is responsible for species decline per se. Um, the WWF's Living Planet Index um, attributes about 7% of species declines to, uh, to warming. In fact, the, the real reason why we are losing so many species so quickly is because we're changing their habitats or just removing them entirely. And certainly urbanization is a part of that. Um, and land change as a result of warming, but primarily it's because we've replaced um, habitats with, uh, with farmland. Um, this is, for instance, in the Am Amazon uh, basin, um, carving into um, the Amazon uh, right there just to lay down some soy livestock um, feed crops, and there's another, another, view, another view there. Now, uh, most of that soy, um, well, all of that soy is really exported for livestock feed, mostly to Europe and, uh, and to China. But getting on to the warming thing, which is obviously a massive existential threat we do all, in, uh, all face, we can safely say now that the Paris Accord has entirely uh, failed. Um, the warming projections uh, presently, we're looking at about um, 2.8 to 3.2 by the end of the century, not including self-reinforcing feedbacks. In other words, things like permafrost melts, just releasing tons of methane into the air, or the wildfires that we've been seeing in Australia and over in California that are just sending gigatons of carbon uh, into the air. So this is still to be seen as relatively optimistic if we're looking at, um, at current policies and where they will lead us. So that's a lot more than 1.5. I think, first of all, it's important to point out that this is actually really happening. And uh, even if it's unimaginable and completely unacceptable, 
that it is happening, we still need to, to remember that science does not need human imagination for evidence. Um, it needs instrumentation and lots and lots of hard work and decades of study, and uh, it confirms that, yes, indeed, it is really happening. Um, technology will not save us. This is also increasingly scientific um, consensus. Um, most recently, looking at the, 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 the idea that we can just simply scrub carbon out of the air, we can, um, you know, we can um, suck it out of the air in these negative uh, emission technology um, vats, if you like, they're not even gigaton capable. And um, 29 European science academies concluded that we can absolutely not rely on NETs or negative emissions technologies to pull enough carbon out of the air at anywhere near the rate that we need it in order to um, save us. What do I mean by save us? Well, when I was born, it was around about 330 ppm um, CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're now looking at about 412 at the latest reading. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the Keeling curve. Um, now, 450 uh, ppm is seen as something of a threshold. That, um, that probably gets us more or less near 2 degrees centigrade of, uh, of warming from post-industrial uh, levels. With a 70% probability, if we keep it under 2 degrees, in other words, 450 ppm, sorry, if we keep it under 450 ppm, then we will almost certainly manage to avoid that, that 2 degree um, threshold with a 70% probability. Just looking at, um, at ocean rise alone, this is uh, Miami at two degrees, which is um, arguably just around the corner. Um, this is Shanghai. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Shanghai. Where will all those people go, you might ask yourself. Bangkok is already underwater at this point. Um, two degrees represents something else relatively significant, however, um, as evidenced in this um, fantastic paper. Well, fantastic if you read this sort of stuff and don't want to... Um, drink yourself under the table, but um, trajectories of the Earth system in the Anthropocene uh, suggests very strongly that it's highly likely, extremely probable, that if we cross the two degrees centigrade warming threshold, we will be um, on an autopilot to 2.5, 3 degrees, 3.5 and 4 degrees, and that's simply an unstoppable um, our course. No amount of carbon scrubbing can possibly compete with the self-reinforcing feedbacks after that point, we're, we're, on a, we're on a course to something, um, a, a very, very different planet. And just to give you a sense of what four degrees, for instance, would mean, should we ever get there, which it looks like we will before the end of the century if we continue business as usual, um, the, the, the temperature rise from the last, from, from the ice age, the end of the ice age, about 10,000 years ago, to 1850 was four degrees of warming. Now that's 10,000 years of time for organisms, including us, <laughs> um, to, to evolve and adapt to that, 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 that warming. Um, we're looking at the same amount of warming in just 150 years. There's no time to adapt. Um, this picture I've, I've, um, I've tweeted a bit, I suppose, but maybe too much, but this was done for the new scientist, um, a visualization of what the Earth would look like, what the world would look like at four degrees. Now, middle and southern Europe have obviously um, entirely gone. Um, North America, um, Africa, um, South America, and uh, Asia, has, ha they, they've all gone. I mean, wh where would those people go? Obviously, they'll head north. Um, the states will move in from a geostrategic perspective. It would obviously move in um, to Canada, um, China, and to Russia. Uh, There've, there've been a, there's been a lot of talk about um, as to the, what that would mean for human populations and human population numbers. And of course, you read some wild stuff. How can we possibly know? But this chap, um, who's had his name on, a hun I mean, 120 papers or something like this, he's one of the most hi highly regarded at atmospheric scientists in the world, um, cited over a thousand times across academic journals in the domain of atmospheric science, um, believes it's just a few thousand people the carrying capacity of the Earth is just a few thousand people seeking refuge um, in the Arctic or Antarctica. Um, and of course, all the way to four degrees, we have war. We have, we have resource depletion, driving conflicts. Um, we have mass migration. And very unfortunately, it is fairly safe to conclude that children alive today will, even though it's still, again, relatively unimaginable, but based on our best available information, very probably face mass migration, um, war and hunger, should we not turn things around? This is just simply the way it is. This is where we are going. 
Um, but surely governments would never let that happen. You hear that a lot. But the thing is, um, they have let that happen, and they are continuing to let that happen. Appropriate response, I suppose, to all that. Um, you know, and th this, um, this uh, uh, UK artist, um, pop artist, sort of experimental pop stuff, um, said this, I wrote this on, on a napkin one day, I really like it, hope without honesty is denial, because people reach for hope at these times. But also I really like um, um, uh, Kate Marvel, climate scientist. Uh, she said that um, we, we don't need hope, we, we need courage. Um, we need, I mean, courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. This is more where we need to be going. Um, Banksy, of course, giving us a bit of a hand here with this. From this moment, despair ends and tactics begin. In truth, there's, um, there's no hope without action. Uh, this is really where we stand. And this is not just my opinion. It happens to be um, a, an opinion uh, very widely spread. In fact, the world scientists, in their a second warning to humanity, very recently wrote that, um, that same thing. They said that with a groundswell of organized grassroots efforts, dogged opposition can be overcome and political leaders compelled to do the right thing. Now, that is um, 15,364 scientists from 184 countries. It's the most science scientific document in all history. They are urging us in the absolute inept, you know, ineptitude and, 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 um, and, and lack of engagement from governments to actually rise up and force governments to act. That's what they're telling us to do. And you can look at, you can look at this as, as a bit like, you know, imagine you have a disease a very rare disease, and that um, the world's expert, you know, that those, those scientists, 15,364 scientists, contains most of the world's uh, Nobel laureates, um, planetary boundary scientists, food system scientists, geologists, um, biologists. They say that, you know, so from the, from the perspective of expert opinion, it doesn't get much better. You can imagine that, yeah, you have a, a disease that very few people have, and the world's expert says to you, listen, it's, it's really grim. You, you are looking at a, at a particularly bleak end, um, an ugly end, unless, of course, you stop now doing these things. You can also think that um, we are, our space habitat um, has a variety of subsystems. It is a freshwater subsystem you know, that looks at water, water purification and filtration, um, thermal uh, regulation subsystem, um, you can look at food pods. They are being attacked on our space habitat. If you don't like the word environment or, or earth, you think it's a bit too kind of patchouli dosed or hippie, um, then think of it this way, because that is what's happening. What they're telling us is that it's time to rebel. It's time to force governments to act, because they are not acting. Uh, no more business as usual. What we need is massive, swarming, non-violent, uncontainable civil disobedience en masse. Civil disobedience, unlike protests, where you just get out on the street and a little uh, you know, marquee you know, area with your little police permit for the protest, holding little signs, oi, 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 um, civil disobedience actually works. It has provably worked. South Africa versus apartheid, India versus the British Raj, US civil rights movement, the Velvet Revolution, it's the way to go. Now, um, Extinction Rebellion is very much a manifestation of that energy. Um, it, uh, the idea of actually uh, channeling uh, civil disobedience to the ends of, of, of driving change is very much what it's about. It's the kernel of, of the movement. Um, it started in October the 31st, um, where a bunch of uh, British activists uh, marched onto um, Parliament Square and declared uh, rebellion against the British government for its lack of of action on the um, climate and ecological emergency. And then um, soon afterwards, 6,000 or so um, descended upon uh, London and effectively shut down the, 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 the city centre by occupying uh, five bridges. Um, Extinction Rebellion is a leaderless, that's very important, I mean, the, the press have always reaches for a figurehead, but it is very much a leaderless, um, it is not steered by the UK, decentralised international apolitical network using non-violent direct action and civil disobedience to persuade governments to act justly on the climate and ecological emergency. I'm just going to um, show a couple of videos uh, right now 
to just give you a sense of the kind of, um, um, of, of what civil disobedience in this case actually um, comprises, I'll show you a video from France um, uh, particularly focused on, um, on overconsumption. We're talking about resource depletion here in, in, um, in the CCC this year, which I think is great. Um, and this was a protest at Block Friday instead of Black Friday, which is, of course, a mass consumerist event. Here we go. They, um, they occupied a shopping mall for seven hours and a whole bunch of stores across the country, Apple Store, etc. Just fantastic stuff. Um, and you might think, where, where is this going? Well, and is that really the only approach, you know, occupying malls and, and shops, etc., etc.? I'll show you another video for a very different strategy. This is um, uh, Extinction Rebellion New York City occupying Times Square. Um, and I think this is, a, is definitely a, what is the video called? That's right, um, player. Sorry, it's a bit cut off, isn't it? Again. Oh well, whatever.
want to be arrested, but they volunteer to be arrested in order to see if we can make an impact. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, <laughs> cool. Something's a bit wrong with my copy, with my, um, with my render buffer there. I can see that. I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, three demands. Typically, some branches have more. Um, there are many branches now, um, 600 plus branches all over the world. Um, some have uh, four demands. For instance, in the US, they, uh, some of the state branches have added a fourth demand for climate and ecological justice. Um, for those most affected by um, changes um, within planetary boundaries. Um, sorry, changes above and beyond planetary boundaries. Um, but in general, there's this kernel of sort of three demands. Tell the truth. The government must tell the truth by declaring a climate and ecological emergency, working with other institutions to communicate the urgency for change. Act now. Govern government must act now to halt biodiversity loss and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. 2025, you say? Understandably, you might think that is a little bit short, but it's good to have goals. Um, beyond politics, government must create and be, and be led by the decisions of a or sortition, a citizens' assembly on climate and ecological justice. Um, and it is working uh, significantly. Um, in fact, uh, if you go to this climatemobilization.org map, uh, and you will see that uh, states, municipalities, and uh, cities all over the world, tons of them, have in fact declared a climate and ecological emergency. What they do after that point is, of course, the next step, but um, I can't find a single one of these that, um, uh, that is dated to before April this year. So in just one year, that is a significant political transformation. Yeah. And it's, yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's certainly not just Extinction Rebellion. It's, it's Fridays for Future have been just like upping the game uh, there massively. So respect. Um, at the COP25, um, which was obviously like a massive failure um, in itself, Extinction Rebellion was listed as the most influential organization above the World Bank, um, um, yeah, Greenpeace, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a relatively short kind of rise of... of, of um, a voice for, for that particular, this, this particular movement. Now, infrastructure for rebellion. Unfortunately, the movement got off to a reasonably bad start in the UK in that respect. Um, they went from the perspective of, what's that? That's a bit odd. They went from the perspective that um, we are an above ground movement. We work in the open. It's not really good for civil disobedience to have that as your like mandate or a priori. Um, and there in the UK, things are, of course, a little bit different. It's something of a playground there for civil disobedience. Um, the police are generally quite nice. In fact, one of the chief of police in the UK said, well, they're actually quite nice people, um, these, these, these activists. Um, it's, this is not something that exports very well. It doesn't even export over the border, um, which I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about in, the, in, the mo in a moment. But they really settled on base camp over in the US. They just went straight to base camp. Um, Google for sharing like, things like contact lists. Um, they, they didn't have anyone of, of, with technical, shall we say, um, know-how or, or operational security um, uh, intuition or, or interest to look at it any other way. So they just reached for what's at hand. The Action Network, too, are ho hosted over in the United States. Base camp, um, I mean, Extinction Rebellion explicitly breaks base camp's terms of service you may not use the service for any illegal purpose. Well, civil disobedience is breaking the law. That's what it is. Um, uh, Action Network, which is widely used by, unfortunately, um, uh, ac activist movements all over the world, human rights space is, as well, they, they really use it a lot. They have just crazy stuff. You understand and agree that we may disclose your information if required to do so by law, court order, a legal process, subpoena, including to respond to any government or regulatory request. I mean, this is nuts. Um, Action Network hosted over in the US under a Trump surveillance apparatus, that massive apparatus that Obama expanded hugely and then just gave to Trump. Um, and I mean, this is an unsafe environment for hosting um, con you know, contact lists. Um, on the 3rd of, um, of November uh, um, last year, um, my partner she said uh, there really should be an Extinction Rebellion in France, and, um, and I th immediately thought, well, they will need a server. Um, there in France, you, you, don't, you, you, I mean, you, you do not want your activists 
on Action Network. I mean, you don't want them using Google because, I mean, in France, this is the situation. Here's France. Um, this is, in fact, Paris um, in, uh, in, the, in the Sully Bridge in the center of Paris with just cops cruising past and just tear gassing them, even taking the sunglasses off and just, and just spraying them right in the face. Um, this is Youth for Climate protesting outside an Amazon logistics center, um, uh, very recently, in fact. Youth for Climate just um, with, with a guy wearing the French, the French stripes in the background overseeing it, he says, yep, you can do it, the state says it's okay, and just like sprays them. You know, this is France. Um, it's a different environment. So I just really got them up and running with something really fast. Iceland was chosen because Iceland is, is very well known for its strict data protection laws. It's well outside of obviously the EU and, um, and of course the, the Five I um, states. And uh, I went with Flockynet, um, geothermal, direct from, um, direct from source, um, or direct from grid source. Um, discourse um, for the forum, rather than base camp, for instance. Nextcloud for all the vital stuff, replacing Google Drive, etc. Hardened open VPN and data partition on AES XTS, 512-bit. Jitsi meet for calls, and, um, and just a very simple MTA. In fact, it's not really an MTA, it's just, a, it's just send mail, XM, XM4. Meanwhile, um, the international movement, um, as branches were popping up all over the world, were, were descending on Slack. Now, Slack is particularly problematic um, for a variety of reasons, but what's, there's a reason why they were jumping on Slack. They wanted a place to, to share um, uh, their, um, their, their Extinction Rebellion broader global needs. I mean, this is just a, a few thousand people at that stage. Um, some people were members of multiple teams, and importantly, they chose um, Slack because Slack does afford something that group chat does not. Many teams, each with channels, public and private. And this is just a, is, is, is a you'd hardly call it an innovation, but Slack itself is, um, is chosen for that team-based structuring or configuration over group chat for a very good reason. As a direct messaging backend, many national branches means many teams. Some people belong to more than one team. But the, the problem with Slack is that Slack is a racist infrastructure. It actually is. It's discriminatory infrastructure. Um, Slack voluntarily chose to follow Trump's digital um, trade embargo, blocking um, like Crimea, Cuba, and Iran, several other countries, just because they thought maybe, I don't know, Trump would buy them a Rolex, I'm not sure. but. Um, it's, it's nuts that they did that, and, um, and then they even defended it, apologizing um, a little bit, um, or sort of not apologizing later. Uh, Google Docs, um, branches were jumping to Google Docs to store contact lists. You know, here's your regional coordinator, your national coordinator, your, your actions and logistics team, terrible stuff. Um, so much so that, um, that in the UK at least, a seasoned, um, 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 a seasoned organization in protecting activists and ensuring that they have legal rights or at least legal protections when they need them um, in the UK uh, decided to pull out of support of Extinction Rebellion on the basis that um, XR UK was, was storing personal data inadequately and that they were very sure that in fact the police would have access to that, to that information. Um, this, when openness is enforced we have a regime of openness doing things out in the open, it excludes. What about those that might work in, in governments or government you know, offices or corporations or, or just those that are a bit nervous about getting involved in a civil disobedience movement? They're not sure they want to actually take that big step. Um, those are not going to feel very comfortable at all doing it in the open. Um, a community-owned hub and opera um, a community owned and operated hub for Extinction Rebellion was absolutely needed. And so I set out just building um, a criterion for this. It had to be community owned and operated um, platform wise, uh, free and open source software outside of the 5i um, and EU member states. Um, it needed to walk its talk and, have, um, and enjoy energy direct from source. No CO2 credits, a la, a la Google and Amazon. Um, Debian. Um, simply because I've been using Debian <laughs> since the year 2000 only, <laughs> and, um, and I just l love it. Um, <laughs> if I start crying, um, you know why. It's not because the planet's dying, it's because I just love Debian so much. But um, It needs to be affordable and very well routed. So um, mission coherent infrastructure was what I was really after. And wh what I mean by that, well, few people are aware that the, the global data center industry consumes, or at least pushes out, I should say, as much carbon into the atmosphere 
as the entire airline industry. This is the same amount as, as, the, as the UK, the United Kingdom itself actually um, burns a year. Um, it's a lot. Um, and organi for Organize.Earth, which was the domain name that was chosen um, exactly 366 days ago, in fact, it was born, I settled on Mattermost, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, and, I, and I settled on uh, Data Center Lite in the Swiss Alps. Data Center Lite, um, direct from source hydro, um, alpine catchment hydro, and there's a beautiful irony there actually, sort of like a bleak poetry, that as warming melts the, the snow on the Alps, it, <laughs> it flows down into these large catchment bays, which then drive lovely big generators that power the data center. I thought, oh, I, just, I can't go past that. Um, it's extremely well routed, their, their VMs are, are wonderfully fast. I settled on Mattermost for these reasons. Um, we had to get thousands of people off Slack fast. So the UI sim similarity was, was, was uh, mission critical. Um, uh, there are export paths from Slack directly into Mattermost. It has that team chat configuration that people in, in activist communities uh, really like now. They've adopted that wholesale. Um, it's reasonably unified uh, UI UX across the endpoint platforms, whether you're on um, iOS or Android or desktop. Team invite links. Teams can actually control invitations to their teams by sending them a link, and they can recycle that link or at least flush it and generate a new one when they need to, to control flow. Um, there's basic team admin controls, um, extremely low entry barrier. Um, the server was entirely funded by one, uh, one fresh, uh, French, I was going to say, Swiss, and then I said French, so I said fresh. Um, uh, one uh, French rebel. It scales lin linearly um, as regards uh, system overheads. It's just extremely performant. In fact, when we got to about 20,000 people in, um, in, uh, in, in Organized at Earth, the server population, um, uh, Mattermost itself was running at about 30% uh, of one core. Um, Mattermost for chat, anything sensitive, you signal a wire. And that's the rule now on Organized at Earth, um, which has become very much the uh, global hub for the movement with 475 teams, mostly national local branches. It's a, it's a, it's a really large um, um, Mattermost um, deployment. And, um, but why not Riot and Matrix, um, Matrix Synapse? Well, in December 2000, 2018, when I was looking at it, it was a little bit immature. Um, the UI UX was a bit geeky, but there were also really, really problems with, uh, real problems with scalability. Um, I just seemed to uh, see that it wasn't something I could really know that 100,000 people, for instance, down the road could actually uh, all use on my particular, say, home server deployment. Um, the device verification was really freaking people out. Um, I mean, some of the the great majority of the rebels, in fact, um, that we are uh, hosting are, in fact, um, the kind that would look for a Google link to log in. Um, there's no markdown. Uh, that has, it might seem a little bit arbitrary, but it's become relatively critical, especially for the code development um, side of things and formatting, making lists. Markdown is important. It doesn't have that link-based invitation management either. But there's also this metadata leakage concern, something that the, um, the matrix um, uh, team are really looking at. Um, and they've said so. They've said that the, the metadata leakage, they want to fix that. Um, they want a more unified experience across, um, uh, across, the, um, across the app layer too with Riot. Um, so I'm looking forward to following that in the future. Zero knowledge, I would love to go that way, but um, given the fact that, um, that we already have a use signal or wire for anything sensitive and use Metamost for, for anything else, um, and use your individual branch servers, which I'll talk about in a moment, for anything truly in internal to your branch, we've achieved basically the same thing because um, Riot, just like with Omemo, um, is not end-to-end -end encrypted by default. It's, it's something that one must actually set up. So we're effectively in the same place. Um, so Organize.Earth uh, has now grown uh, to host a, a large number of platforms, which I have deployed there. We have, of course, Mattermost. We have Nextcloud, two instances. Um, only Office um, is used for collaborative uh, editing. Um, that has some missives I'll talk about in a moment. Etherpad Lite is used really heavily. Lime Survey replaces Google Forms. Um, we, Jitsi Meet doesn't really replace Zoom, but um, this is something that we're working on very much. Um, Rain Loop um, with Dovecot and Postfix for, for, the, for the mailing. 
And then we have um, yeah, GitLab. GitLab has been a massive success. We have uh, a few hundred uh, coders now working flat out uh, in the GitLab um, that we have deployed. And uh, it is very interesting that many of them say that would, they would not be able to do what they're doing on GitHub, given that um, GitHub is tied to their work. GitHub is tied to their, to their real life a little bit too much. And they are genuinely worried about uh, boss or corporation or company uh, surveilling them when they are maybe, for instance, engaged in, in, a, uh, in a project that is technically um, legal, illegal or quasi-legal. Um, yeah, discourse. Um, discourse is, is used, I guess, less heavily on the main organized at Earth server than it is on the, some of the branch deployments. The French server, for instance, now has 17.3 members in its discourse. 17.3 thousand uh, members in its discourse. 17.3, what a win. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's, it's the marketplace of chatter. Now, um, <laughs> signal and wire, um, replacing the, um, uh, the uh, WhatsApp and Skype. Yep, Mastod a Mastodon node was, uh, was created, which has become quite popular with, um, with branches. And we have PeerTube replacing YouTube. And importantly, um, we're working very hard to ensure that we have a gender balance as much as possible um, within the admin space of uh, all these platforms. On the back end, um, of course, Debian, mm -hmm. um, AES-XDS for the data partition, um, fail to ban, um, and uh, UFW for the firewalling. Um, those, that have you, those of you that are taking photos of this are feds. I see you taking photos. Um, take photos. <laughs> Snort for um, the intrusion detection, uh, Prometheus, and hardened um, OpenVPN. Um, I'm really into duplicity for backups um, and Percona for hot MySQL backups. Uh, it's a real problem when you're trying to back up huge databases that are 14, 15 gig um, plus plus. You, you, you can't take them down long enough to do a dump with, say, MySQL dump or something like this. Percona provides a really interesting solution for hot backups. Um, I had to work on optimizations um, with NODB heavily in order to get the kind of performance that we're squeezing out of uh, Mattermost and its interaction with MySQL um, on, the, um, on the server. Um, Nginx, um, we now support two um, uh, protocols, v4 and v6. Um, the v6 um, uh, addition was certainly very, very bumpy. And I wish it wasn't so bumpy, but it was. I just guess I thought I knew or understood v6 better than I actually did at the day of deployment. Um, Postfix and Dovecot, and then we have uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, but platform challenges. Uh, Jitsi Meet does not replace uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom is just simply more performant. I think it's around about 1.7 megabits per second um, is, the, is the sort of a lower level um, minimum bandwidth required for a, um, for, a, for a user in order to have a quality call but Jitsi Meet is higher. And so when you get people on 3G, they just drop out. And we sometimes have 40 or 50 people in a call. And, uh, and Jitsi Meet is not cutting it, unfortunately. Uh, only Office, um, unless you want to pay 6,000 a year, um, you are looking at, which of course we won't, you're looking at um, only 20 um, simultaneous editors at the same time. This also needs to, needs to change. Um, thankfully, Nextcloud's text um, app um, seems to offer us a a sweet spot there as far as uh, simultaneous editing. Um, in the meantime, uh, Etherpad Lite is being used uh, really heavily. Um, there's a lack of admin controls in Mattermost, um, which is precisely why we are forking it. We are forking Mattermost, which is a massive job, um, such that team admins can, of all those hundreds of teams, can individually manage their, um, their memberships without having to rely on me to drop into the, into the CLI and, um, and use the Mattermost tooling to do things like, um, uh, you know, following the GDPR, you know, deleting all of the posts of a particular of a particular um, uh, member, and we have SSO uh, expectations um, for a mostly non-tech uh, membership. People are so used to the idea, especially the the very the, the younger and the older end of the sort of the demographic, both expect um, one login, one unified login for all platforms, and this is just a real hassle. Um, and that is something that's very difficult to, to manage. Um, but, I mean, Mattermost acts as an OAuth 2 provider, so that does offer us some interesting possibilities there. The XR server platform um, has since evolved. It has this. Um, MailTrain is the mailing list manager, and this is working real well. I mean, MailTrain v2 is sweet. Um, with, a, with a Docker Compose deployment, I thoroughly recommend giving that a go to replace your you know, MailChimp 
whatever um, needs. Um, we also have a Rebels Manager as the CRM, so um, this effectively replaces Action Network and it leverages MailTrain. There's a, the um, very talented developers in, um, in, in Brussels or Belgium have uh, put together the Rebels Manager, which will be deploying across the entire movement. And um, yeah, it's working out real nice. As far as the deployments, um, uh, the branch servers deployed um, in the spirit of decentralization, I have deployed these um, and there are many, many more to come. And these are entirely independent from Organized at Earth, from the, the main hub. They um, are self-run, self-administered. Um, admins are trained over 10 to 25 hours, uh, and then the keys are flipped, and then they just sail off on their own. 2020 plans, um, the Mattermost fork I mentioned, but importantly, um, the wire Mattermost in, in, uh, integration. What I'd really like to see, and what we're talking about uh, with, within the rebel, rebel coders, I guess, as we call ourselves, um, is to uh, have a, a wire add-on or plug-in for Mattermost such that you can just simply click on a bunch of different people that you'd like to engage in an end-to-end encrypted voice call or chat. Very excited about that one. And uh, enhanced team admin controls. Um, team, um, team administrators should be able to do a lot of the work that, uh, that I uh, shouldn't be doing. A federation feature, which effectively uh, replaces um, Mattermost's um, enterprise um, offering, which is about three... I think it's about $3 a month or something per seat. It's a crazy amount of money. I mean, and in our populations, it would be completely impossible to afford um, that, that sort of um, um, uh, the, the enterprise, enterprise edition anyway. So we are actually sort of forced to fork Mattermost, which I'm sure is really going to piss them off, but we are going to do it. We've already started. Um, Jitsi Meet rework. Um, we want to build in um, an OAuth wall for Jitsi Meet. Um, such that we can protect, protect our instances. Um, simultaneous session recording, not using Jibri or with the um, Chromium browser on a server, which I can't believe is the solution that they have chosen. Um, I will never ever install a browser on a server. Um, it's, just, it's just illegal. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> it's, just, it's just wrong. Um, bandwidth optimizations, uh, we need a lot of work done there. Rebels Manager replaces Action Network, um, and then we want to have a member-facing um, services dashboard with that OAuth 2 flow. Um, and particularly, um, and, and very importantly, uh, co-location deployments. Um, working out of VMs is all very well, but you do have uh, key theft from RAM as a, as a plausible possibility in many instances, uh, so to speak. And so what we would like to aim for is uh, being able to drop off um, um, uh, dedicated um, boxes with the RAM epoxied into the slot, and um, good to go, nice and locked down. Um, yeah, Swiss VPN for the entire movement. Uh, this is something that I should have done um, within, a, within a few weeks. And I also want to obsolete myself so I can dedicate myself to other movements while maintaining at least a, a tech advisory role with an Extinction Rebellion. Um, <clears throat> but it is time for techies to, to rebel. Uh, there is no hope uh, without action, uh, but there is no action without infrastructure, at least not at the scale that we need it today. We need massive deployments, um, dis distributions. Um, people need places to work and to organize and to do so safely. Um, SysOps, DevOps, coders front and back, all can dedicate an hour a week or a couple of hours a day to a cause which is probably best described as the single biggest challenge that we as a, as a species actually face. Live in your time and dedicate an hour or two a week or a day if you, if you can uh, to this. Maybe not Extinction Rebellion, but Fridays for Future, Sunrise Movement, future movements to come. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in Extinction Rebellion and joining the, uh, the, the very large tech team, then visit rebellion.global, find your local branch, get an invite into Mattermost, and then um, see you there. Another end of the world is possible. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much. Julian Oliver. Extinction Rebellion. If you have questions, 
You know the procedure. There are microphones uh, from one to number six. And as far as I know, we already have questions from the internet. So, Signal Angel, question number one, please. Hello. Someone from the IRC wants to know how do you enter the encryption passwords for your data partitions uh, during automated reboots in the data center? This is completely in, uh, impossible to do um, with, uh, for, the, for an encrypted root file system, um, obviously. Uh, one needs to, uh, in fact, look at data partitions that are encrypted, but the root file system not, unfortunately, on uh, many of the deployments that are not colo and those that do not have the, the, the flexibility of presence at the point of entering that password. So from that, from that basis, um, we, we go with... Uh, uh, a, an encrypted AES XTS 512-bit encrypted data partition, um, and one comes in over the VPN, tunnels in through SSH, and uh, and then and then decrypts and mounts. I, I realize it is not exactly ideal, but um, it is all we can do in the VM space. And the next question from microphone number two. Hello. First of all, thank you so much for all this work you put into uh, creating this platform for the movement. Uh, my question is, what measures have you taken uh, to protect uh, yourself against the case where, for example, your home is raided by police and you know, they try to somehow get into the servers um, through other means than just impounding them? I'm being socially engineered, aren't I, um, in public? <laughs> oh, no, no um, I, I'm, I'm particularly cautious about that stuff. Uh, and uh, all of this, all the, the sysadmins, of which there are now about 30 uh, across the different branch deployments, we have very, very strict um, procedures for this sort of thing, um, including um, redundancy across backups, uh, leaving home check, uh, powering off the laptops. In fact, just like I installed this, the entire movement's uh, infrastructure, community-owned infrastructure, on a ThinkPad X230 that I bought for 145 euros on the German eBay. And... Um, and I've encouraged all of the sysadmins to buy the same, precisely because you have this, the lovely battery lock on the back. You can just flip it and, and un pull out the battery, you know, if you're ever facing um, police or a stop and search. And of course, in some countries, like you know, maybe India or Brazil, this becomes really critical. Um, but um, there is just a routine. I'm leaving home, I'm powering off my laptop. Um, uh, we just which screen locker we're using, key pass, um, uh, you know, uh, phones um, uh, encrypted, at the file, at the at the at the the, um, the file system, and we 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 just have to do our very very best. There is no such thing as perfect sort of forward security in this space, but um, all we can do is employ best practice operational security, and also most importantly treat sysadmins as high risk um, first stage targets, um, and they are increasingly. Uh, so from this perspective, uh, sysadmins are forbidden to go to actions. They cannot be arrested because there's always the possibility of coercion. And we actually have a whole kind of script with sysadmins when they're entering into the fold to, to explain to them you are aware of the risks, you know, and you need to lean on your branch to explain to you the, 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 the legalities of, the, of your operating environment. What are your rights? Can you be coerced to, to cough up a password? You know, um, to, to give the master key to your, to your, um, to your key pass. Um, for instance, like this, um, you need to know those rights. You need to know your rights, and if you can't deal with the heat and you don't want to go that distance, then step down from being sysadmin and give it to someone else who is willing to go that distance. Um, there's so many factors, and again, we can't generalize across the entire um, uh, geo, cultural, political, jurisdictional space that Extinction Rebellion works in because it's just so various. Yep. Thank you. And uh, the internet has another question. How do you keep your community of, as you explained, mostly non-technical people um, on your geeky and decentralized solution as it grows? No problem really keeping them. I mean, um, it's maybe when one of the founders says something like completely controversial or absurd. Um, this is being recorded, isn't it? Um, then, then yeah, we, we have we have lost some number, understandably, but. Um, the, the, the server population just grows day in and day out. And I, I'm expecting in 2020, at this current rate, we are looking at, a, at around 400, and 400 to 500 new members a day uh, on the Mattermost, um, at least. And with branch server deployments, um, uh, it'll be three or four a month um, until we've uh, filled all the national branch requirements. 
There is no problem for that. Um, Mattermost it is uh, it's seemingly reasonably enjoyed, not so geeky um, in that sense. Uh, discourse is also very widely used within the, um, I mean, Twitter uses discourse um, internally, but also publicly. You see many large corporations and organizations and NGOs using uh, discourse as a forum solution, as a discussion forum solution. So it's actually familiar to a lot of, um, a lot of people anyway. Uh, the, the geekiness, I would say, is probably when we start talking about the need for a VPN. That's when a lot of people just switch off. So there's a lot of um, cultural work, techno-cultural work, if you like, that needs to be done there in order to secure the movement further. Thank you. Um, microphone number five, please. Hi there. Um, so you talked a lot about your communication infrastructure. Can you share anything about your financial infrastructure? That's also very varied too. I mean, branches um, have their own funding um, coming in, but then there are others that, um, that will receive funding from... Previously, it was the, the UK was managing a lot of that funding, but that's entirely switching now to um, the international support team. Uh, which is a, a multinational group, if you like, organization within Extinction Rebellion that does handle all the finances. And donors would come to the movement wanting to give money, and then it's distributed uh, throughout the movement as needed to meet the ends of, 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 of branches. Uh, it, it's still, just a year in, it's still quite um, uh, varied. I mean, XR Germany, for instance, actually donated to the global movement recently, so it came back that way. Um, it's, uh, I think it's it's always going to be relatively uh, ad hoc, um, especially also given the fact that some financial institutions, state craft, um, are very much on the tail of... I, I just spoke too much, didn't I? But, um, no, but... Um, nope. Yep. <laughs> you need to be very careful about, about where bank accounts are um, as regards the tax state. And so I think it's just going to be a changing um, uh, environment for quite some time. I don't actually know much about the finances side of things uh, to answer that wholly, but, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Microphone number three, please. Hi. Um, a lot of people find it very hard to go from discontent to dissent, and uh, more people tend to get involved if, involved if we lower the barrier of entry. Mm. Um, so, you know, it sounds great when you say, a like, a, couple of, couple, a few hundred new people a day globally. I... I suspect it would be more the, low, the more you lower the barrier of entry if you have some sort of a gateway drug. Um, so what are you thinking about making some kind of system, some, some kind of an easy invite, sort of a one-click, get the in invite to matter most thing that would make it easier? Well, that already exists. The, 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 the organized on Earth is really only the, the global hub where branches will, for instance, inter, inter, interrelate, collaborate, um, interoperate if you like, but the branch server deployments themselves, they will handle their own um, onboarding if you like. But uh, there is certainly some streamlining to be done there. One of the things that comes up a lot is password complexity. We have a very strict password complexity policy um, and that really frustrates people that would like to name, uh, would like to give the, the, the password the name of their dog and, 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 and the year, um, maybe at best. But you know, we, we really need to work on on finding a sweet spot. We don't want to also have people going into arrest, forgetting to power off their phone after following the, the, the encryption um, operational security guiding that we have, and then their phone is, is, is you know, face um, uh, swiped into or something like this, or they're just tricked into swipe unlocking their phone, as happened in the UK, and then they're, going, they're finding their way into the platforms with best guess passwords. I mean, who knows? We, we need to find a, a common middle ground, but also educate as to why it's important that we use these platforms and in these ways and have passwords of these strengths, et cetera. Um, it, it's an ongoing process. I see the interwebs has a question. Someone on IRC wants to know why did you think it was necessary to um, set up new infrastructure uh, instead of using other radical tech infrastructures like RiseUp, for example? Well, RiseUp had, um, uh, yeah, I mean, RiseUp has its own has its own problems. We really wanted to go over for community-owned infrastructure such that we can legally be responsible for that infrastructure, that we can say that it is here for us, and that if there is any um, uh, there's any attacks on that infrastructure, we are in a much better legal position to be able to represent ourselves from from our um, um, uh, operational uh, circumstance and jurisdictional circumstance. It was also very important that it's in Switzerland. Importantly, um, in Switzerland, 
um, uh, for, for, for Swiss data centers, you need to break the law in Switzerland before there can even be a request for, say, a, uh, a, a service seizure. Um, and that needs to go through the highest courts. This makes Switzerland a very, very nice place to actually deploy server infrastructure for a civil disobedience uh, movement. Rise Up simply doesn't meet it in that, uh, in that capacity. Thank you. Microphone number one, please. Hi. So my question was partially responded already about the financial infrastructure you have. I know some associations, but like, you know, they could afford 100 bucks per year or something like that because they're so low and you know, doing brilliant work. But so it seems to me that you deployed tens of servers just for the V1. So what are your initial costs? Could you lighten up that so that you know, I can act back home? And uh, how do you get the money initially? I, I, installed, um, uh, I installed almost all of that infrastructure without receiving a single cent from Extinction Rebellion. And in fact, I receive very, very little money from Extinction Rebellion now. And it was only um, after um, burning through all of my savings from November to August. I burnt through all of my savings and, um, and ran myself financially into the ground and did it entirely on a, on a gratis basis. And only then after that I have a, a very small amount of living expenses paid, which is really tiny, but just enough to cover my costs. And I can make a lot of money uh, deploying servers if I wish to for dreary NGOs, etc., etc. But I have dedicated myself to do this on the grounds that it needs to be done and it needed to be done. Um, yeah, so it was actually free for the movement. Yeah. Thank you for that offer. Pleasure. <laughs> um, microphone number two, please. Right. Um, you already mentioned that um, the server partitions are encrypted at the data center. So do you have any other OPSEC um, mechanism in place, for example, if the data center is raided? The, the data center can't actually, at least without it being a, a breach of constitutional law in Switzerland, be raided. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are... Um, there are some measures put in place for a, a switch off in the event, but I can't talk about that um, without putting other people um, on the, in the hot seat. Yeah, but it, it, is, it is all sorted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the internet has another question. Someone on the IRC wants to know, do you share the recipes for your DevOps uh, deployments and specifically were signal and wire difficult to set up? Uh, well, sig Signal is, is not so difficult to, to set up, but the, the, maybe uh, it, it is easily confused with the fact I mentioned the wire server deployment. Um, I'm in talks with wire at the moment, um, those that make wire, about a server deployment for the movement such that we can actually run our own um, entirely and, uh, and ag again, write apps um, for, that, um, for that server for use in the movement. But um, I think wire and Signal, as far as an, an, an end user, um, uh, install is extremely easy in getting them up and running. I think Signal has problems, obviously, with the, the phone number discovery aspect. I mean, SIM cards, um, I don't know, the license plate numbers these days. Uh, I, I'm really quite a fan of Wire's um, non-dependence on that. Uh, but as far as the blueprints are concerned, uh, I really do hope to write a, a as part of my self-obsolescence um, plan, is to write a, uh, a full documentation for the server installs, for the, for the post-install auditing, um, and uh, such that it can be handed over to someone else to do the deployments for me. And I think I have actually found that person. That person happens to be German um, and very, very sharp. So I look forward to the possibility of, of publishing that um, at that point. But for now, it's just uh, a case of me doing the deployment, and then I sit down with sysadmins for 10 to 25 hours and walk them through what that server is and how they can sail that ship. That's how it's done at the moment. Thank you. I think this is a call for participation, right? It is indeed. <laughs> it is. Microphone number two, please. Is the Mattermost fork public available? It will be, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's just started. Um, it's something that we just kicked off. So hopefully um, by about mid-year, I think we might have something that you could put into staging. Maybe not production ready, but we'll see. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be great. And it's going to be great for the community as a whole. I mean, outside of Extinction Rebellion, but just those that would like an alternative to Slack that doesn't have dumbed-down team admin controls and has maybe Federation. 
if you really want to grow something really, really big, the sweet spot is a fork of Mattermost. I'm, I'm convinced. Yeah. Thank you. Microphone number three, please. Why no digital civil disobedience? Uh, yes, um, I can't talk about that, but I'm very, very enthusiastic about it um, and have been engaged in that um, a, a little bit here and there in, in the past. Um, but yeah, electronic um, civil disobedience is, um, is very close to my heart and uh, there's lots of it happening in the movement and it will be in 2020, um, but I can't talk about that, obviously, at all. Yep. I'd love to, but I can't. So sad. <laughs> yeah. Microphone number two, please. You're running a lot of services with huge attack surface. What is the worst that could happen should your infrastructure get compromised? With uh, services with what, sorry? What is the worst that could happen if your infrastructure is compromised? Um, well, the, 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 the branch servers are entirely decentralized from the, from the organized at Earth Hub. Um, I would like to think that it's highly unlikely that organized at Earth is compromised. But if it were to be um, compromised and I was not able to um, if, um, instigate a power off event um, in process or prior, then unfortunately um, it would be, there'll, there'll be access to large uh, email um, uh, registration information largely. The NODB is database encrypted, uh, the database layer, but um, unfortunately. Uh, if one has root, if one can privilege escalate to root, then you would have access potentially to a decryption of that database. But there's little we can really do about that. Um, uh, if we find in 2020 that, say, um, there is encrypted by default, in other words, zero knowledge with Omimo or with uh, Riot, abstracted over Matrix and Synapse, well, hopefully Dendrite, written in Go, and it is really performant, and it can run six-figure populations, it can support six-figure populations, then we'll absolutely switch to that, and I will drive that change in that time. But in the meantime, just use Mattermost for general team chat. Everything else goes over signal or wire. That's how the movement runs right now. Yep. Thank you. Unfortunately, we run out of time. Julian, would Fine. you be able to answer questions in the, uh, after the talk? Yes, of course, yes, absolutely. So. Dorfer, uh, if you have questions, uh, come together, come to him, and uh, ask your questions. Julian Oliver, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you.